Listen, I'm super excited to be here with you all in the Pilling Lane community, and, and many of you are not only deeply committed to the work of advancing anti-racism in LA County, but many of you have had the experiences, right, uh, and understand what we're really committed to. So today I'm gonna talk to you a bit about what that looks like. What I'm hoping I can do is sort of ground this conversation in, in something that makes sense for you as well. And so I'm incredibly excited to be here with all of you today. I, I'm honored to have been invited to speak and I very much look forward to a robust dialogue. So let's go ahead and get started. So, you know, you heard I'm the racism czar, which is my job to eliminate racism in all of LA, right? I'd say that with a bit of a tongue in cheek expression. Uh, it's certainly not something I can do by myself or solely in any way. It is absolutely an effort that is gonna have to be uh, led by, engaged in, and driven by all of you in this room, as well as many of our leaders in the county. But what I'm excited about is after having served in the nonprofit sector for about 14 years and having served in the military for five years, I had the opportunity uh, to uh, join the county and in doing so, um, help build out an organizational unit within the county to help transform the institution itself, but to use the authority and the leverage of the county to do more for LA County as a region. But I'm gonna open up with the land acknowledgement and hopefully you've had one of these today and I'll just do it again for the sake of um, making sure that we honor and acknowledge um, the truth, right? That we bring uh, respect to a history that has been lost, uh, that we acknowledge and reconcile our relationship with that history, and that we lift up uh, the first and ancestral peoples of this unceded territory, the land that we call Los Angeles County. With respect to their elders, past and present, I recognize the Tongva, Tataviam, and Chumash as the original stewards of this land and as those whom we must continue to lift up along with their stories and their culture. So today I'm gonna to talk about understanding and contextualizing racism. It's really important to start from a place where we ground this conversation in a shared understanding. We are each walking into this, this room today with a different understanding of what race and racism means. So as I get through this presentation, I'm gonna share with you what we uh, think it means. And by the way, my role at UCLA, I just, I just, it just hit me just now. I just got some chills because I'm standing in the room of, of, of Dr. Solis and I just saw B Strong on the, on the wall. Um, B uh, Solis um, was the first person, I just have to acknowledge this because I'm standing here in this room and just did the land acknowledgement. She uh, was the first person who got me a, a grant here in the California Endowment when I was leading my organization. Um, and um, also is the person whose class I took over at UCLA in Fielding School of Public Health. And so um, being in this room, I sort of feel her, her spirit and her present and rec presence and recognize uh, her leadership because if it weren't for such a person like that, I wouldn't be standing here today. So I just, I had to, had to get that off my chest. Um, so understanding and contextualizing racism, we're gonna talk briefly about what the RD Initiative is, and then we're gonna talk about what it means to advance prevention and promotion efforts. And the reason why we're gonna talk about prevention and promotion today is because it's so deeply related to the work that you all uh, are doing. And then I'm also gonna talk about what it means to become an anti-racist organization and how we move towards becoming anti-racist in our organizations, in our field, and throughout our networks. So let's talk about this, right? I always start by talking about the data. When people think about structural racism or they think about racism, right, we often disconnect it from the data. And the data itself is where we ought to start. And the reason why we start here is because it shows, for example, that African Americans and Native Hawaiians and, and Pacific Islander communities can live anywhere between 11 to 13 years less than their counterparts. Um, we see that Native American and African American students are typically um, experiencing the highest gra uh, graduation, uh, high school graduation rate gap. We see African American children are more likely or three times more likely to, to be diagnosed with, with asthma. Um, and there are reasons for this, and we'll get into some of that soon. We see that African Americans are four times more likely to experience homelessness. We just saw the homeless point in time count come out where now uh, Latino populations are beginning to grow in representation and homelessness in LA County, uh, but we still see disproportionality in and amongst African American groups. We also see that three times as many Latino, Latina, and Latinx children are in households with incomes below 200% of the federal poverty level. And that is all reflected in a certain set of conditions that we're gonna talk briefly about today. So. When we're talking about racism, we're talking about a relationship of power. It denotes the ways in which people in positions of power can make decisions that affect other people's lives. It's pervasive. It's sort of interwoven. Our, our CEO often likes to say that it's like sugar and water, right? You mix it up, you don't see it, but it's there. You taste it, you know it's there. 
Racism, uh, again, denotes a relationship of power. It limits one's self-determination in that if I'm in a position of power, I can make decisions that prevent you from achieving the thing that you're setting out to achieve, and obviously doing so on the basis of your race. Now, structural racism talks about the ways in which racism is built into our society, and we often and, and already talk about the three pillars of structural racism. Now, you see this you know, uh, picture here on your left uh, of, as, as an example of um, uh, an effort to uh, push for fair housing laws in California. Uh, but what's important to note is that there were racially restrictive covenants written into housing, and this is one of the ways in which we see racism play itself out, right? That you cannot live in a certain place because of your race. Um, and you might be wondering, well, you know, those covenants were eliminated. Well, why, why does that matter today? And I'll get into that shortly. We also recognize that these three pillars that I mentioned of structural racism are related to the ways in which our institutions, um, our geographies, and our relationships to others shape outcomes in our lives. These are essentially the structural foundations uh, by which racism itself is enacted in our society. So what does that mean? What does it look like when I say institutional forms of racism? It looks like the decisions that public and private entities make. So for example, Trader Joe's has a policy of not putting a grocery store in a community where the median income is anywhere less than $60,000 or 100,000 in certain neighborhoods. So if you are from Inglewood like I am, where there's 140 uh, liquor stores and 100, I'm sorry, 140 fast food restaurants and 120 liquor stores, and not a lot of access to healthy foods, right? We call it a, a food, um, uh, it's not just a food desert anymore. My friend uh, Gwen called it a, like a food swamp, you know, not, not Inglewood as a swamp, but the idea of living in this environment where um, all of this food itself is, a, there's some good food, and there's some problematic food. And what she says is, you know, in these conditions, um, you know, we, are, we can only access that which is available to us. So think about it this way. We often like to blame people for their circumstances. We like to say, hey, you should have made better choices and better decisions right, in your life, and therefore you would be healthier. Therefore, you'd have a better job. Therefore, you'd have more educational opportunity. But if you go to a school where you don't have access to a college counselor or Morningside High School as I was when I was a kid, and we only had four AP classes, compared to my colleagues at Beverly Hills that had over 20 AP classes, right? If you, go, if you, you live in a set of conditions where um, you don't have access to healthy food, if you don't have access to college counseling, you don't have access to the resources you need to thrive, you can't make a decision to eat healthy food, right? Your choices are only as good as your circumstances. So your behavior is shaped and dictated by the spatial environment in which you live. So that's one of the ways in which structural racism shows up. It's both the, the institution making a decision, but it's also the geography within which you exist. And then finally, relationally, right? When we think about this, Many of us got to the place that you're sitting at right now because you had people in your life who cared for you, who looked out for you, who said, hey, you know, I'm going to make sure that you get into college. I'm going to make sure that you graduate from school. I'm going to make sure that we, you know, put you in this program. I'm going to make sure that you get this sports opportunity. I'm going to make sure that you get that internship with that marketing firm back east. I'm going to make sure that your children have an opportunity. I'm going to make sure y'all get these scholarships, right? All of these things happen because most of us had access to relationships and a network that made it possible for us to thrive. Without access to those relationships, you lack access to resources. Without access to mentorship, access to uh, the people who can teach you how to navigate through institutions and systems, you are less likely to be able to take advantage of opportunities. And as such, what we recognize is that in the context of these institutional, relational, relational and spatial um, uh, pillars, we find that processes come to bear. Processes such as exclusion, exploitation, and control. So people, if you don't have access to those resources, those relationships, you get excluded. If you are, um, you know, busting your tail off, right, and you take, for example, Inglewood again, I'm just going to speak about my home because it's, it's where I'm from, it's where I grew up, and in Inglewood, um, you know, one of the things I did prior to coming to the county is I fought for housing justice. So we got um, rent control passed for the first time in a generation to help maintain and stabilize rent in Inglewood. So Inglewood now has rent control because my organization did a lot of work to make sure that happened. And then we also fought to make sure a community benefits agreement was passed uh, or adopted in the city uh, because they were building all these stadiums and arenas. But while, this, while that was happening, you had a lot of speculative businesses, Colony Starwood, Tricon, coming in and purchasing up all these homes. So black and brown folk, um, and even some Asian American populations were unable to purchase in their own communities. Children who grew up in the neighborhood 
could not come back and buy properties in Inglewood because the, the, you know, you had organizations like Blackstone that had what's called a, a buy and hold strategy. So they would buy the property at half of its price, hold on to it for its six years, and then they would elevate, you know, the, the, the equity would raise and they would sell it at a much higher price. So that's a form of exclusion. Or you take, for example, um, an exploitation, right? So you take, for example, the ways in which uh, workers themselves are also uh, taken advantage of in terms of the, the wages they're able to make and the rise in rents. Uh, and you can see these multiple processes come to bear. So you can also look at exclusion as a form of opportunity hoarding, right? So I have access to resources. I'm going to keep those resources. And I'm not going to share them. Um, you know, exploitation could have been, you know, uh, human, it could be human trafficking. It could be land theft. It's Bruce's Beach, for example. Um, and then control. We have mass incarceration and in some cases racially based police violence that occurs in our communities or even American Indian genocide, right? So, so you have multiple ways in which these processes come to bear. So why are we talking about equity and equality and all these things today? Well, I'm not just talking about equality. I will never see the ground that we need to be treated with equality, right? We all need to achieve equality. That is absolutely true, but equality is not good enough, folks. Let's just say it plainly. Treating everybody the same, giving them the same resources, and expecting them to take advantage of the same opportunities does not necessarily mean that everyone will thrive. Equality in and of itself is a great concept, but you need equity to get to equality. And what equity recognizes is that differences matter. They were all starting from a different place in our backgrounds. Right? So if you think about this like a runner on track, right? if you've ever run track, you've seen kids run track, track typically goes around in circles. Um, the runners start at different places on that track, right? Because the person who's further out um, basically needs a different starting place because the distance between their, their, uh, in their lane is greater than someone who's starting from the, the inside lane. Um, and so it's the same idea. If you're starting from a set of conditions where you lack resources and opportunities needed to reach those, uh, uh, those outcomes, you are more likely to remain in those same conditions or be in a position where the status quo is maintained. And so what equity calls for is justice, that we treat people justly according to their circumstances. It's about justice. It's about doing the right thing by people, making sure that resources and that power is distributed in a way that is what we consider to be anti-racist. Now, anti-racism is ultimately about identifying and eliminating racism by changing those systems. The things I just talked about with potentially Trader Joe's or LA County's child support policy, for example, or maybe our child welfare system, wanting to make sure that we reduce disproportionality in those systems. And making sure that we do so by addressing the organizational structures, the policies, the practices, the procedures, the attitudes that people have so that we ultimately redistribute power and resources equitably. Now, we didn't get here overnight. And this stuff is not by, the outcomes that I started with did not happen by accident. And that's why I always start with outcomes. Because outcomes are how you see structural racism manifested. The disparities are how you see, is how you see structural racism manifested. So we know that in LA County, there were decisions that were made. By the way, I, I was um, sharing this tidbit with some folk last week at, a, at, the, um, at another uh, event. And I shared with them that, uh, uh, that half the people that founded LA County, I don't know if you know, but there were people of African descent, right? So there are about 40, I think 43 people, 43 settlers that came from Mexico, Spanish settlers, and half of them were former slaves. And so when you look specifically at the ways in which even Los Angeles itself was founded, um, it, there, were all, there were all these sort of racial implications around how LA itself was created, including the breaking of treaties with Native American, American Indian tribes and nations, as well as efforts that were led by the real estate industry and policies that were endorsed predominantly by white voters in LA County. Uh, and we saw this show up through policies like redlining, which came out of the Federal Housing Administration, the Home Own, a Homeowner Loan Corporation. Um, and if I showed you the data today and you specifically look at these maps, what you will find is that the very locations that were either red or yellow line, both of them had the same effect. And what that basically meant is that, you know, the banks wouldn't give you loans because they were not um, backed by the federal government. The risk was not backed by the federal government. So African Americans and Latino, Latina, and Asian American populations were concentrated in certain neighborhoods, and those neighborhoods were divested from. They couldn't build wealth. 
they couldn't modify their, their property, right? There was a lot that they were denied. And as such, um, what we come to see today is that LA County is one of the most segregated cities, even though it has more than 200 diverse languages, we're still one of the most segregated cities in the nation. And what you also see is that if you look at these redlining maps, and I pulled up our Equity Explorer on LA County's website right now, something that my office created, you will literally see that neighborhoods of concentrated disadvantage, where most of the poverty exists, are in these red lines. It's like 80, 85% are in these red line neighborhoods. So from the 30s all the way on to today, nearly 100 years, you still see the, the effects of divestment and segregation in Los Angeles County. You also see the effects of racially restrictive covenants uh, and where people are able to access housing that's affordable to them. You see the effects of Japanese internment. I don't know if you all knew, but um, there's a school in Manhattan Beach, one of the elementary schools, is built on former Japanese-owned land that was from, from someone whose land was taken. Um, these, the Japanese internment policies also ex exacerbated um, housing uh, uh, displacement in LA County at the time. You saw movements between uh, Little Tokyo with African American communities who were moved in and then displaced once Japanese Americans returned. You see all of these things continue to uh, have impact upon our very existence today. And by the way, you don't just have to take my word for it. So if you want to break out your phones, you want to take a look, you want to look at these QR codes, you are welcome to look at that history yourself and understand the relationship between that history and LA County's geography and outcomes that we experience today. And so we put these QR codes up there for you so you can see how anti-Mexican racism led to, to the Zoot Suit riots. You can see how Sugar Hill, which was a predominantly wealthy African-American neighborhood, was, was um, destroyed. Um, because of the freeway, and if you know anything about the freeways, freeways were built to help create enclaves in, into suburban communities to move people from downtown into suburban neighborhoods. And there was something called the freeway protest where these wealthier neighborhoods in Laurel Canyon and Santa Monica and Beverly Hills fought to make sure that those freeways were designed and run through neighbors, neighborhoods of color uh, under policies called urban renewal. So all of these things existed. And it led to the elimination of very well-off African-American neighborhoods and Latino neighborhoods as well in LA County. So, you know, just do your homework. All right, now, done some level setting, right? All right, cool. Now, what are we doing about all this? So the Board of Supervisors said, look, we recognize that America's never really, you know, dealt with its original sin of slavery. And as such, we need to take action as a government agency. And so our board passed a motion in July of 2020 um, seeking to end structural racism and its consequences in LA County. They created an organizational union, the CEO, CEO's office, and I was asked to come on board to lead. And what we've been able to do in LA, in, in LA County, and specifically in the Anti-Racism, Diversity, and Inclusion Initiative, is come up with a vision by which we recognize that LA County needs to be a place where all residents are healthy, where they experience justice, and they thrive. And we're doing that by building capacity for our county departments and agencies and organizations throughout LA County to build equitable policy, to strengthen their workforce, to utilize data in order to redistribute resources and power. Our goal is to support positive life outcomes and to prevent negative life outcomes, right? So to change that data that you saw in the beginning. If you ask me whether or not already worked in 10 years from now, and we're setting 10 year goals by the way, if you ask me whether or not we worked, I want you to come back and I want you to hold me accountable and I want you to look at that data. Because that data is how we demonstrate whether or not we've actually done our job. The data is where it's at. If people's lives are not getting better, right, and if I'm in Band-Aid mode or protect my job mode or, you know, uh, anything else other than trying to render myself useless, right, in this way. So, for example, I know we're not going to solve racism overnight. We didn't get here overnight, right? It was a construct that was created, a social construct created to maintain power over people uh, of African descent. I know we're not going to eliminate it overnight, but I would love to so I can go work on climate change, right? Or go work on something else that has bigger implications because we all going to die from climate change, right? So like, let's get past this piece here so we can move on to some really big stuff, right? All right. Now, we're involved in a lot of stuff. So if you're ever interested in knowing what Artie's involved in, these are all the areas that have been outlined for us by our board. Truth, racial healing and transformation, sustainability, policy, justice, uh, child and family welfare, health, we're doing work in, around STD. Uh, we are um, doing, decrim we're, we're doing decriminalizing mobility efforts to make sure that people can legally ride their bicycles on sidewalks without having to be pulled over by the cops, right? Uh, because after you, if you recall here in LA County, Dijon Kizzy was shot by the police in South LA, by the sheriff in South LA. 
uh, because he was riding his bike on the wrong side of the street. And if any of you have ever ridden a bike in South LA, you know you gotta ride your bike on the opposite side of the street. I don't care what they say, because you don't know who's coming up behind you, you don't know what's going on, right? Like, it is a safety issue for you. That man was going from the store to his house, and he lost his life, or his life was taken in the midst of that, that process. So we wanna fix that, right? That shouldn't happen to anybody, not a single one of us. So we're working on stuff like that. I'm super proud, because we also got Bruce's Beach done. So, like, that was in my office as well. Um, that was a lot of work, y'all. I'm telling you right now, that was not easy. We had to change state law. One of our supervisors said, she said, he said, look at how hard it was for us to do the right thing. We had to change the law to undo racism, right? Racism is baked into the law. We had to get state law changed. We had to change local county government law, governance law. Like it's the default is the thing we don't want. All right. So. The big thing that I came to talk to you all about is what we're doing with regards to prevention and promotion that I think is incredibly relevant for all of you and certainly will affect the work that you're doing here in LA County. So our board directed, so we, you know, we were talking to the board and they were like, hey, Artie, we want you to really do something about disproportionality in our homeless services system and our child welfare system and our juvenile justice system and all these systems that we operate. And so they said, take on this incredibly large effort to help us reimagine how the county engages in prevention and promotion services and, let, and come back to us with a set of recommendations on whether or not we can create a new office to do this work. And I gotta tell you, you know, we may not need to create a new office, right? There may be some things that we can do in LA County to help improve our system, like coordinate and share data across our departments, or um, provide contracts in an equitable way so that they are located in communities, so services are being provided in community much like what you all do here. But I'm gonna to talk to you about what we're trying to do. So in, 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 the board, in the board adopting this motion, they said take racial equity head on and take racism head on so that we can focus on how we just deliver upstream programs and services to improve well-being and strengthen our families, including adults, children, and youth. Come back to us with a recommendation on the governance structure, identify how we can fund this, come with a staffing plan, et cetera, and give us the data that we can use to hold folk accountable. So what is prevention? It's simply stopping bad things from happening. That's it, it's preventing negative outcomes from occurring, undesired population outcomes, child maltreatment, substance abuse, juvenile delinquency, high school dropout, family convictions, et cetera. And promotion on the other hand, and we often get these two things confused. We sometimes use them synonymous. We're like, we wanna prevent bad things so kids can go to high school, can graduate from high school. That's true, that's prevention and that's promotion. Promoting positive life outcomes, making sure that they can graduate high school or pursue a trade or you know, get a good job or have a, a healthy birth, right? Um, those are all promotion outcomes and opportunities that we want to be able to take advantage of. And so having both ends of the spectrum, prevention and promotion, are incredibly important for us. Now, y'all are working in this field. Uh, and I'm just going to tell you right now that when this field was created, it was not created for many of the people that you're serving now. Um, when the Social Security Act was passed and the Aid for Dependent Children's um, uh, I think it's Title IV and, and V when these, these codes were passed. They were created predominantly for white, single, non-working mothers. It was intended to sort of redeem, after the Great Depression, it was intended to sort of redeem the um, uh, viability of white families. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? We will, certainly want all of our families to thrive. But black women were initially ineligible. And when a successor program came about in the 60s after sort of a mobilizing effort from Bed-Stuy, uh, TANF, it imposed strict work requirements and time limits to reduce dependency. And let me tell you what happened. When they were debating this law, which is, by the way, sort of still in the books and affects us today, they said, we do not want to give this program to black mothers. You might ask yourself why, right? You can flat out say it's racism. But that's true, it, is, it was racism. But it was also an economic, we call it the Black Economic Utility Standard. What they said in the record, you can go back and look for yourself, it's in the Columbia Journal of Law and of Race and Law. They said, we don't want to give black mothers these benefits because during the cotton picking season, we still need them to pick cotton. This is in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And if they get these benefits, they won't be on our plantations picking cotton, okay? So our, our welfare programs and child programs were designed to maintain exploitative labor for black folk and brown folk and others in our society. 
They call them illegitimate mothers. Maybe they shouldn't be out there having babies. You know, you saw one of our former presidents call them welfare queens to leverage racialized narratives about who deserves to receive these resources and who does not. Um, you saw the denial of benefits. Men, for example, were not eligible, I think, until the late 60s, early 70s. And it was Southern Dixiecrats, actually, Southern Democrats, who were like, no, 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 don't give those folk these benefits because we need their labor. And so when you think about this, right, and you think about all the systems that have been created since then, and you think about current efforts like the Family First um, Prevention Services Act, which uh, will fund some of the work that you all do here, uh, there are requirements that certain families be designated as, you know, uh, uh, they, they, must, they must be uh, determined to be neglect, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, they have to face neglect and be, be designated as, as being neglectful parents, et cetera. And a lot of these policies came out of a history of family separation policies that have been around since slavery, since times of slavery, including uh, uh, a focus specifically on black and indigenous families. Uh, as well as sort of the ways in which families were forcibly placed in residential schools. I mean, even the founding of Harvard, right, was like a, uh, uh, a, a school for Native Americans. So um, American Indian population. So you see this history play itself out in different ways, and all you got to do is just follow the law. So this is what structural racism and follow the money. This is what structural racism does for us. It becomes so pervasive that we don't even know that the very thing that funds the work that we do is grounded in these racist tropes or ideologies that have set the policy or the law that is used to drive the programmatic activities that we're engaged in. Never mind that, you know, we had the war on drugs and mass incarceration and the school to prison pipeline and the siting of toxic emitting industrial uses near black and brown neighborhoods. Uh, you, had, you have the, the lead plant from Exide that's nearby here in East LA that's affected Latino and Latina populations. You have at Jordan High School in Watts over 60 years. If you went to Jordan, anybody went to Jordan High School? Anybody? Okay, there was lead in your water since the 60s that never got repaired, right? So these types of things have happened and have been happening in communities for generations. Now, most of these policies have systemically excluded and denied support um, because we only call families a certain type of family. And again, we codify that and how we, uh, we codify structural racism and how we define even the words family and what's normative and whether you believe uh, in uh, a certain sort of family orientation or not. Um, is, uh, I think, not really the point here. The point is that we uphold certain standards in our society that um, are shaped and, and, and um, uh, can be identified in our policies. So we're putting together a new model, folk, and this is the new model. We're saying we're going to recognize that social conditions affect the level of risk that people experience so that we can ground the resources we provide in community in equitable decision making so that community leaders can take a charge on what's needed for, their, for, the, for folk in their own community. And that we're gonna provide both permit, prevention and promotion programs. The county has never had a framework or a model by, upon which we can all organize ourselves around so that you know how, at what point you need to intervene and provide services either for the whole population or for populations that have elevated risk or for populations that are at imminent risk or for people that already have the disease. So if you're, for example, living with HIV infection, then you currently have the disease. So one of the best things that we can do, we can't eliminate it, right? You're always gonna be in risk, but we can remedy it, we can mitigate it, we can intervene in a way that allows you to live positive life, a positive life. So, now that you know what we're doing around prevention, now that you know who we are, now that we have sort of a common understanding of structural racism and how it plays out. Oh, by the way, let me give you another good example. Do you remember that data chart I, I shared with you uh, at the top of the conversation where I said that African Americans and Native Americans live anywhere between 11 and 13 years less than their counterparts? Well, one of the reasons why, one of the ways structural racism shows up is in our retirement age. So our retirement age is often, what, 65, right? So think about it this way. You're a black person. You work most of your life you're ready for retirement, you might die by the age of 75, so you've now worked most of your life to pay into a system that you only get 10 years of benefit as opposed to other people that have been working most of their life getting 20 years or double the amount of benefit. So the retirement age is fixed for everybody, it's equal, right? But if I'm black and I'm only gonna live to 75, why am I not retiring at 55? Right? Why don't I get the same benefits that I'm paying for with my tax dollars and all my hard work over these years that other people are going to get to live another 10 years on? 
right? This is a good example of structural racism. We don't even see it. See how pervasive that is? You can't even recognize that the retirement age in and of itself is deeply problematic for many populations in our society. All right. Now, what do we do about it? Where do we start? So the Center for Social Inclusion and Race Forward came up with a framework where they said, look, you can transform structural inequity through not only dialogue and conversations on race, but moving towards a policy solution that works for everyone. So we start, you know, I've, I've been talking about structural racism and the impacts on one population, including the impacts on another. But one of the things that we can think about strategically is how all of these things impact us all. So we tie these things to our universal values. All of our children should be able to thrive. It doesn't matter what your race is. Nobody wants to see a child on the street or a child go hungry. I don't care if you know, you know what their background is or not. When you see a homeless child, that's a problem. And most of us feel for that child. Most of us want to make sure that people can do well and can thrive and eat. Not all, but most of us do. And what CSI and Race Forward do is they put forward this framework where they say, look, you got to take the race wedge on. Like, it's often this zero-sum game. Well, if I invest in these communities of color, that means we're divesting from these neighborhoods that are more affluent. That's not actually the case at all. And we can talk briefly about what that means. But you got to take that issue on. Um, you got to pay attention to the messenger. Sometimes you may or may not be the right messenger. You might need somebody from a community or maybe somebody not from that community to deliver a message that is framed in a way that is accessible to that population. Sometimes we like to walk in the room thinking, hey, I know it all and I'm gonna just tell you what you need to know because I'm the expert in that field. Well, that's not always true, right? I might walk into a room with folk who are from a different community than me and they're like, you're talking about my issues. Why don't we have people who lived who walked in my shoes, who can help me understand it from my perspective, right? It may be people experiencing homelessness or people uh, that may be a part of the LGBTQ plus community, right? It could be any community, but ultimately identifying who the messenger is and understanding how to approach that conversation is really important. And then taking on race directly and how we frame things is really important. So this is not about black people, right? So often, you know, they're like, well, if you give this to black folk, then what does that mean for Chicanos? Or what does that mean for white communities? Or what does that mean for, for those communities, right? So taking that conversation head on is really important. And how to do that, um, there's a worksheet I can provide for you all after the fact that I, can, I will share with you from CSI uh, that'll give you some direction on how to do this. But you can also use images and words sometimes, you know, that, that redlining map does its job, right? Like, I can't explain redlining better to you than you can by looking at the map and seeing how people were historically excluded and denied from opportunity. And then finally, pay attention to your audience and adapt messaging. Um, when you're affirming, you can use what's called the ACT framework. You can start with the heart, explain why we're all in this together. You can explain and sort of counter in the, in the arguments of, of your colleagues and those who may not be interested in doing this work. Uh, explain why we have the problem. Here's the history, the stuff I started with in the beginning, and take on race directly. Right? You don't have to shy away from it. You can actually have a conversation about structural racism and what it means. Reframe makers and takers. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I just gave you the example of um, Social Security. Right? Uh, you know, Black women have been considered welfare queens, and yet black folk are contributing significantly to the welfare system in our society and are not, are not even able to benefit from it in a, uh, in a, uh, um, uh, you know, over their, their lifespan, over an expected lifespan. Right? So you have, you know, there, there's often this idea of who's deserving, who's not deserving of support and resources. And then finally, ending with heart and solution. Right? Um, you know, I'm standing up here today, uh, me, D'Artagnan, I'm standing up here today uh, as someone who grew up in South LA, both in Watson and Inglewood, uh, when um, my, uh, my, we were evicted uh, when I was a kid, when I was about seven, seven or eight years old. And then my sister got a brain tumor when she was nine. She passed at the age of 33, God rest her soul. She got a brain tumor when she was nine years old, and the doctors told us she was only gonna live until 14 years old. Um, she ended up living at 33, and um, you, know, uh, you know, we were fortunate enough to have all those years with her. Uh, but after she had her brain tumor and had her surgery, uh, my mom couldn't work. So we, were, we got evicted, and um, my sister ended up being able to get Social Security. That was like all we had, and then, and then we ended up getting on food stamps or SNAP or EBT or Cal, Cal, you know, Cal Fresh Benefits, as we call them today. And I remember getting this bike out of the, the, um, uh, the trash. It was one of those little banana bikes. Y'all ever had those banana bikes? Those banana bikes, right, with a long little thing in the back, and it's wide. I went to, um, I got a little paper route uh, around uh, Perry Middle School, this is when we were in Gardena, uh, to sell the Daily Breeze at the time. Um, I don't even know if it was called the Daily Breeze, but it was the same paper company. 
And I use that little money that I earned, my little $11 a week to build up that bike, get the tubes done. I went and got some royal blue paint from Pep Boys. I don't know why I chose royal blue. And then I rode that little bike with my food stamps, the food stamps my mom gave me, to uh, the grocery store, which was a couple of miles away, to cook for my sister and I. My mom was trying to get a job. So you take that experience, my experience, right, which frankly shapes a lot of what I do, um, and you look at it and you think, well, look at this guy. You know, he's standing up here. He's talking to us. He's, you know, not that special, right, because I'm not. Yet, along the way, it took people in my life to help me navigate through those circumstances. My high school counselor, Ms. Garcia, who was like, you're going to apply and go to college when I didn't think I could. My church buddies who were like, you're going to go after I got into UCLA, because uh, I didn't think I could afford it. Um, my second grade teacher, Ms. Gilliard, who made sure that I was able to thrive. And I hope Ms. Banks and Ms. Ubre, my ninth and 10th grade English teachers, and Ms. Vuknik, 9th, 10th, and 11th grade English teachers who are like, you're going to learn this language so you can thrive, right? Despite all of the circumstances, there were people in my life who rallied around me to help me get to the place that I am today. And that's, in some ways, what it means to have heart, right? It's both solution. The work that you are doing is part of the solution but the heart you have for it to ensure that people can thrive and do well is the same heart that we want others to have in order to address racism. But sometimes it doesn't work. And it doesn't work inside of our organizations because sometimes we like to get real rulesy. Some of y'all like to be like, I'm going to put my foot down. You're going to deal with this today, right? You're going to learn today, right? That's what we be like. You're going to learn today, right? And so we put in all these rules, and sometimes those rules lead to shaming and blaming. Sometimes we have negative messaging in our diversity training. If we don't do this, we are going to be liable for sexual harassment lawsuits and this lawsuit and that lawsuit and your mama's lawsuit and your daddy's lawsuit too, right? Like we put these messages in our training, and it's not motivating the people to come. Right? They don't want to participate in something if they think there's a consequence for them not participating. I'm not suggesting that you don't have an enforcement mechanism, but I am suggesting that we rethink how we get people to enlist and enroll in this work. Tokenism. You might be the only person in that room helping to carry, and tokenism also often refers to like the stereotypes that are upheld uh, up on someone who may be representing their group or their, their subpopulation, whatever that population may be, a subdemographic. Uh, and the ways in which they may be called out, relied upon to help speak for that entire group. Uh, and that often leads to burnout, at least to significant challenges within an organization, because you go to the black or the brown folk and you're like, can y'all help us fix race and racism inside our organization? Right? And that you got to be, suddenly become the overnight expert in how to solve racism cause, just because you black or brown. And you'd be like, I don't know where to start. What are you talking about? How about you do your own work, homie? Right? That's, that's, what you be, that's what we say. How about you do your own work, right? Why are you relying upon me? I'm already tired. I've been working my tail off on this job plus now you want me to do all this and you ain't even paying me for it, right? So some of those conversations, I know those conversations take place, trust me, I know they do. Sometimes we do this in people's performance ratings. Sometimes we'll be like, oh, you know, you need to carry out this work and if you don't do it, I'm going to use your performance evaluation to enforce it, right? Now, that may or may not be a bad thing. I'm not suggesting it's a bad thing, but make sure you're paying attention. If you're going to hold people accountable, they have to have the resources and the skill set to meet that level of accountability. It is unfair. I don't care who you are. It is unfair to say, I'm going to put this new rule in place and expect you to be accountable. You've not bridged the gap between the expectation and the accountability mechanism. Um, now, grievance procedures. Look, grievance procedures are often put in place because we want to protect the organization from HR fallout, right? I put a grievance procedure in place to make sure I can hear your complaint. Um, but often grievance procedures become the place where all the complaints go. It's like that suggestion box that nobody listens to, right? You go to the restaurant like, tell us how we're doing. You know darn good well, if I put my comment in this box, y'all not going to change anything about your operations, right? <laughs> I'm going to come back in here. It's going to be, the, I'm going to wait till three people go ahead of me the next time if I decide to come back. So 
the grievance procedures can be problematic if, again, they are not constructed in a way that actually takes advantage of supports along the way. So for example, not just putting in like, um, you know, submit your sexual harassment complaint or submit your racism complaint or your, you know, whatever the com complaint might be, your inappropriate conduct towards other complaint. Um, I also want to give you resources. So let's make sure that as you're submitting that complaint that we give you access to the EAP, the, uh, the um, uh, Employee Assistance Program, right? You get mental health supports, you get uh, time off and resources to process through and deal with the challenge that you may, you may be facing. So it's not only just saying let's make sure that we hear your voice through a grievance, but making sure that you put in place the resources needed to address that challenge along the way. Because it could take you months to resolve those challenges and things are festering in the organization along the way. Uh, finally, um, you know, there's command and control. So uh, finally, there's ineffective recruitment, hiring, promotion, and retention processes, onboarding processes. Sometimes, you know, you may not be recruiting from a more diverse audience, so you don't get a diverse pool. Or you may be promoting people who just arrived, and uh, there's often the complaint that, you know, folk are like, I've been working here for years, I've been busting my tail off, I've been doing well, and I get passed over to the new person who just came in, right? And in fact, there was an article that just came out about anti-black bias, and I think it was, there was a warehouse that talked about how these black laborers were training a lot of these workers who were coming in, who were getting promoted above them, who had known their jobs for years. It was in the LA Times a couple of weeks ago. And so sometimes that'll happen inside of our organizations, maybe not intentionally, uh, it could be unintentional, but really motives don't matter, right? What matters is that someone's life course is impacted. All right, now how do we move to making sure that these things work? Folk, I'm almost done. How do we work to move in making sure that these things work? Um, you can work to set goals and collect data and measure change over time. So this is not just inside of the workplace. It could be, but this is also with the work that you're carrying out. So if you have, for example, programmatic outcomes you're trying to achieve, set a goal on what it is that you're trying to achieve, but link that to the life course outcome you're trying to change at a population level. So what are you actually trying to do in society or in Los Angeles County or in your community to alter the disparities that I talked about at the top of the, the conversation? How are you making sure that you're not just capturing like your performance or the, the output of things that you're doing, but you're also capturing the relationship between what you're doing and the improvement in life outcomes over time. So if you held 15 workshops, did any of those workshops actually do what you had hoped they would do? Did you even have a goal for holding those workshops? Or did you just do a workshop because you thought, oh, that's a great idea, right? Like, when, look, like I'm in a nonprofit sector. I know what's up. You can't hide from me, right? Sometimes you got a program staff member who's like, they would come to my staff and come and be like, you know, Darn, I have a really good idea. I want to run this program because I think it'll be good for the youth. I'm like, okay, I like that idea. Come back to me with a plan. Tell me what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Tell me your milestones and your objectives so that we can determine how best to get there and what resources are needed. Oh, uh, no, that's too much work. <laughs> okay, let me help you get this done because it's a good idea. But let's make sure that if we're going to make this investment, it actually works. It does what it is that you say you want it to do. Um, you don't have to use employee grooms procedures solely. You can do, as I mentioned earlier, use an employee assistance program. Also, um, remember that we, you know sometimes we want to move fast. We want to move towards adopting technology. The important thing to know about technology is that technology has the biases of its creators embedded in it. So the algorithms, the systems, the platforms, uh, especially like in hiring and workforce data. Uh, if you go to any sort of organization, there could be a, a number of them, like Cornerstone or Bamboo HR. Or, you know, thisify or thatify, whatever it might be, uh, it could be ADP, these institutions have bias built into them. And so auditing that technology to determine whether or not your evaluation of your hiring or workforce data is getting you the information you need is really important. And then utilizing that data and this information to identify and resolve problems before they grow is also really important. Sometimes we're scared to talk to our fellow employees, or if you're a supervisor, I know sometimes, sometimes people may be intimidated by you, but often we're intimidated by our subordinates, right? You might be intimidated by you, so you're like, oh, I don't want to make them upset, oh, I don't want to do, so, so, so sometimes we shy away. Some of y'all in here are like, no, not me, mm, mm I will tell you today and tomorrow what to do. No, I get it, I understand it, okay? But that's not always the case in our organizations, and sometimes we want to, you know, we want to be friends. We, we go out after work, we, you know, we go have a, some tea or some coffee, or we, you know, invite each other over for dinner. I had a former staff member, I had one of my staff members years ago who was supposed to be at, at one of our school sites at 7 a.m. And um, I probably shouldn't be admitting this, but I am, because this is just the way it works. So his director uh, uh, used to cover for him. So I'd be like, hey, he's supposed to be at the class and be at the site by this, because we have to start this, this, the program at 7, 7.30. 
uh, in the school, uh, and we were providing like direct assistance, and there was a week where he was just late. He was just like oversleeping. So I would be like, what's, what's going on? Like, what's, what's happening? And then it got to the point where his supervisor didn't want to tell me that he was late. Because, you know, they're friends, they're, you know, they're boys. We're all, we're all friends, right? We're, we're good. So I call up to the school. So then I call them both in. I'm like, okay, I'll tell you what. So how did it go this morning, right? <laughs> you know, tell me what happened. Oh, no, it was great. I showed up on time. Okay, so you're going to lie to me in my face right now? Okay, you're just going gonna to flat out lie? So I tell them, look, I called the school. You were not on site. Why were you not on site? And eventually he said, man, I just overslept. I'm tired. Okay, now tell me why you're tired. What's going on? Are you burned out? Should I put somebody in to replace you? Do you need some time off? Right, let's troubleshoot through the challenge because you're a good person. You're a good guy. You do a great job. But if you're going through, the, what's, what's, is something happening in your life? Like, where are you at? Let's get you the resources you need so you can continue to thrive. Because just because you showed up late doesn't mean it's the end of the world. But it also means that you might need support too, right? And if I'm going to be willing to do this work with our young folk in the community, I need to also be willing to do this work within my organization. And it's not good enough that I just say as a leader, this is what I'm going to do. We have to include our supervisors, our managers, and other leaders from the very beginning. We also have to score our programs based on priority outcomes, allocate resources, and create accountability for results, efficiency, and innovation. Now, I'm getting ready to close. Um, it's important for us to note that sometimes it's hard to do this work because not everybody in our organization share the same perspective. Surprise, right? We know this. So maybe they have an outdated perspective, and that's fine. But recognize that and acknowledge that and determine what your action plan is going to be to help uh, support the development of that team member. Uh, they may bring a lot of value to your organization. It doesn't mean you just want to throw them away. It means that you want to think about what value they can provide, and perhaps the value is in a different way than um, either uh, in the position they may be in or even within the organization itself, but it does not necessarily mean that that perspective needs to remain in its place. So it's okay to examine those perspectives. Sometimes our organizations, uh, organizational efforts resist in, exist in silos. I deal with this a lot. I love LA County. It's a great organization, part of the county family. I see people that are here. But if anybody in LA County told you we don't have silos, they would be telling a lie through their teeth, okay? Because we have a lot of them. A lot of silos, all right? Sometimes one department that I, 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 I have a, you know, it's on my desk right now. I have three departments that are like, I'm like, hey, can you please make sure that this data gets to this department? And they're like, well, we don't have a data sharing agreement. I'm like, but you're all serving the same person. What are you talking about, right? Like, well, you know, there are all these reasons why. And OK, fine, let's figure out how to get through it, right? All right, inability, lack of desire to prioritize resources. It's going to take money, y'all, to be anti-racist. you gotta re you got to reassign resources. I don't care. You can't get away from it. You can't get around it. It's just what it is. You've got to think about, like, how do you reallocate? It doesn't mean you have to go out and get new resources necessarily, but it does mean that you have to think about how you use your existing resources more effectively. Again, I mentioned earlier about setting goals. Um, sometimes it's difficult for us because we don't have the capacity to collect data. So I don't think you have to be the data guru in your shop or have a data team all the time. But at the very least, start thinking about like what information, because all data is is, a, is inputs, right? You're trying to get inputs to make better decisions. That's what data is for, getting information to make better decisions. That's it. So what information can you get based upon your existing capacity to make better decisions for the population you're trying to serve and for folk within your organization? Um, and this one's a big one because I talked about equity and the difference between equity and equality, and sometimes that is not a clear thing that people know. Um, and understanding the difference between equity and equality and applying equity and equality are very, very, very vastly, um, uh, incredibly, you know, largely different things and concepts to, uh, to, to engage in. Because just talking about equity is not the same thing as applying it. Right, applying it means using tools. It means sitting down and looking at that policy and procedure if you're Trader Joe's and saying, you know, we have this policy of not putting a grocery store in a community that has an income that's less than $100,000. You know, if I'm a restaurant, my EBITDA, right, my earnings before income tax deductions, et cetera, my, if I'm looking at my, my revenues, I can't operate my, my store here, but if I do this, I might be able to do that, right? So being able to look at your policies will help you do that. And finally, folks, let's not kid ourselves. There are some people that are out like, I ain't doing this crap. I don't care what you say. I don't care how you say it. 
this does not apply to me, we are not racist. Nobody's calling you racist, right? We're saying there is structural racism. Um, and so you're gonna, you're gonna run into resistance. Fine. <laughs> it is to be expected. You hear it on the media, you hear it on the news. Steal yourselves, get ready for it. It's gonna come. So think about what you're gonna do to address that resistance. When you're trying to do the right thing and bend the moral arc of the universe towards justice, not everybody's trying to bend with you. They may be trying to go in the opposite direction. So that's cool, just recognize it and be ready for it instead of acting surprised as though, oh my goodness, why aren't we all on the same page? Well, you're not gonna be on the same page. You were born in different generations, born in different neighborhoods, you have different backgrounds, it applies that way too. You can't be like, oh, we're gonna take into consideration equity and make sure everyone's background is taken into consideration and then the people who are being resistant, you're like, I don't care about your background. Get on my page. No, that's not how things work, right? We have to have strategy in place to address that resistance. And so you're welcome to leverage the work of the Government Alliance for Racial Equity and Race Forward, as well as other networks like CSI I mentioned earlier. You can develop and refine equity tools within your organization, and then you can also pilot practices and tools within your programs or your departments or your units. And then finally, you know, building relationships outside your organization at places like this can help build your internal capacity and expose you to new information so that you can build stronger systems in your organization. I think I'm at time. Right? So I want to thank you all so much for your, the opportunity to be here with you before uh, the, today. Grateful to be in B's room. Um, thank you all so much for the time, and we'll wish you all the best. <laughs>